Would you pray with me? Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds and bodies to the recreating power of your word, that we may see the world through the mind of Christ and live in the world as a foretaste of your new creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Old Testament reading today is Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his host. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind, fulfilling his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. The gospel reading today is from John verse 13, or chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. When he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The word of the Lord. Be to God. On this fifth Sunday of Easter, we're talking about love. The question, what does love mean, was posed to a group of children four to eight years old. And as you might expect, some of the answers were funny and cute but some of the answers were more profound than you might imagine. So see what you think. A seven-year-old said, love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he is handsomer than George Clooney. <laughs> Noel, also seven, answered, love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. <laughs> Evidently, even young children understand that love prompts certain behaviors. Love can drive our decisions as well as our actions. Chrissy, who was six, said, love is when you go out to eat and you give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. And Rebecca, age eight, said, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even though his hands are getting arthritis. That's love. So love prompts our actions, and we know this, right? Love drives decisions and, and actions and behaviors, and that's true for God as well. So let me invite you to join your hearts with mine in prayer. Good and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts give glory to you and build us up to be more faithful followers of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So all of the New Testament teaches that it was out of love that God entered into humanity as Jesus, right? What's the one verse that's known by every sports fan in the world? 
You see the poster held up, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Ah, God's actions always grow out of love for us. And God's love was embodied in Jesus who came demonstrating love, modeling how we are to love, teaching us in parables about what love looks like. And in Matthew's gospel, Jesus taught that there was one supreme law, and that was to love God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, and to love your neighbors as yourselves. And then he follows it up with saying, on these two laws hang all the other laws and prophets meaning that all lesser laws are to be judged on the basis of that one supreme law. Which reminds me of a poster I used to have in my office when I was the music director. And it said, rule number one, the conductor is always right. <laughs> and if you believe the conductor is wrong, refer to rule number one. <laughs> So for us, Jesus followers, rule number one is love. And if you ever doubt that you're supposed to love, refer to rule number one. Time and time again, we see Jesus speaking to this. In Matthew 12, we learn that the Pharisees came after Jesus because he had healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. And they ask him, the law says you are not to work on the Sabbath. Aren't you going to keep the law? And Jesus' answer was clear. Of course he would heal, even on the Sabbath, because God's command to love supersedes any human law. Jesus raised that bar for loving again and again and again. Don't just love your family and friends, he said. Love your enemies and pray for those who would do you harm, those who would persecute you. Those young children who were polled about what it means to love understood that showing love is not always easy. An eight-year-old said, you really shouldn't say, I love you, unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot. People forget. And a six-year-old wisely added, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend you hate. Yeah, loving someone you hate, that would be challenging for me. How about you? Even loving someone who spoke unkindly about me or loving someone who cheated on me or loving another who vehemently opposes something I strongly believe in, those are all challenging things. The gospel reading today was found in John chapter 13, and that chapter begins with a very foreboding, ominous verse. Verse 1 says, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And then John proceeds to lay out the events of that evening that we have come to call Maundy Thursday. Maundy comes from the Latin word mandate, command. And we see Jesus modeling this radical love just minutes before he said the words that Nathaniel read for us. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Do you know what happened that night, just minutes before he spoke those words? Well, let's think. Think about Monday Thursday. What happened on Monday Thursday? The Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, yes. Then they sang a hymn, they went out to the garden where he prayed, they slept, and then he was arrested. But do you remember that earlier in the evening, during the dinner, Jesus got up from the table and he got a basin and he washed the feet of the disciples. 
Now this occurred to me this week, I've never thought of this before in my life, but it occurred to me this week that Jesus washed all of the disciples' feet. He didn't just wash the feet of those who were his favorites or who were faithful. He also washed the feet of Peter, even though he knew Peter was going to deny him three times that night. So what about Judas? Do you think Jesus would have knelt down and washed the dusty, dirty feet of Judas? Well, verse 12 of that chapter makes a very brief, informative statement. John writes, after he finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. So I can easily make that assumption that Jesus washed the feet of all of his disciples, including Judas, that evening. Even though he knew that the actions of Judas would result in his arrest and everything that would follow. Love one another just as I have loved you. Choose to love even when it feels impossible. My friends, love isn't just some romantic feeling. Love is an act of will. Just ask anyone who's been married for decades. Ask my spouse. Do they always feel madly, passionately in love with their spouses? Yeah, probably not. But they choose to love. Every morning when you wake up, you choose to love that one. Even when you're not feeling too full of love or even when they're not acting very lovable. It's an act of will. The love of God isn't mercurial. It doesn't grow or fade based on feelings. And it's not conditional either. People might say to you, I love you because you are so funny. Or I love you because you do such nice things. Or I love you because you always do what you're told. Jesus' love for us is not like that. It's never conditional. It's just for us. Even when we make a royal mess of things. The love that Jesus has for you and me isn't merely an emotion that can diminish over time. Christ's love for you is forever. He loved his friends even though he knew they would betray or deny him. He loved the unlovable, the lepers, the social outcasts, the poor, all who lived on the fringe of society, those the world still would rather ignore or dismiss. And he loves you and me. And this is his command for us. Love as you have been loved. So, if we could discipline ourselves, if we could shape that will that we have in us so that we could, in fact, love as we have been loved, how different would that make your life? How different would our families be, or our schools, or our workplaces, or our neighborhoods, if we could love without having strings attached? Choosing to love rather than judge. Choosing to see the other, even the one who is the most annoying infuriating, aggravating person, to see them as a child of God who is also loved. The oldest United Methodist Church in Indianapolis is Roberts Park, UMC. And according to their pastor, they've spent the last 20 plus years focusing their ministries on the homeless in Indianapolis. And in the last few years, they dedicated a sculpture depicting Jesus as a homeless man sleeping on a park bench. 
You can Google the Canadian artist. His name is Timothy Schmalz. Timothy Schmalz has created over a dozen of these homeless Jesus sculptures. These statues can be found all over the world. And the church hopes that the sculpture will be a permanent and visible reminder to the people of that community of the hard, challenging words of Jesus especially those for them in Matthew 25, where Jesus said, come, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world because I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me, so on. And then Jesus said, just as you did it for the least of these, you did it to me. The sculpture is a park bench with a man huddled up, his face almost covered entirely, but his feet are exposed. And as you approach the statue, you may think it's a real person asleep on a bench, but when you get closer, you may see the wounds in the feet, the marks of crucifixion. And the pastor admits that people react in different ways when they come upon this sculpture. Some just walk on past, Others walk around as if, as if someone is really sleeping on that park bench. And the hope is that it will provoke a thought. What if this was Jesus? What would I do now? How do we followers of Jesus put the love of Jesus in action? If we see or hear about someone hungry or in need or strangers, what are we going to do? Care for them? And Jesus says, if you do, it's like you're caring for me. In our world, fear can be an enormous motivator. It also can shape our thoughts and decisions. And God in Christ pleads with us all to live out of love to choose love for God and for others, always. One last story from the children who were asked about love. A four-year-old child playing in the backyard noticed his next-door neighbor, who was an elderly gentleman who had recently lost his wife. And the little boy saw the older man crying. And so he went out into the other yard and he climbed up in the gentleman's lap, and he just sat there. Later, when his mother asked him what he had said to the neighbor, the little boy said, Nothing. I just helped him cry. How do you love as you have been loved? Perhaps you walk alongside someone in grief, Maybe you become part of the welcome team that the fellowship and evangelism team is forming just to greet people as they come into this space. Maybe you're going to Puerto Rico. How will you love as you have been loved? Jesus said, I have a new command for you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I'm going to invite you to enjoy about 37 seconds of quiet. And I invite you to bring to mind those people who are so easy to love, those you love well, as well as bring to mind people that you would rather not have to love. And then just invite Jesus to speak to your heart, to change your heart, so that you can be a disciple who is grounded first and foremost in his love. And after 37 seconds of quiet, I'll close us in prayer.
Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for never giving up on us. And thank you for the gift of your spirit, which can help us to be disciplined and to choose to love. We pray that we will make a difference because of you. And we pray it in your name. Amen.